And we now move on to questions to the Minister for Social Development. And I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Question one. Um, the members will recall that my colleague, the Minister for Finance and Personnel, provided an update on the Building Successful Communities programme in response to a request from David McElveen on the 27th of May. I don't propose to cover the same ground because obviously the answer is available in Hansard. However, I'm glad to have the opportunity to respond personally and to reaffirm my complete commitment to the objectives of this ambitious pilot. These objectives spring directly from the vision of housing-led community regeneration, which I outlined in my department's housing strategy. That's a vision focused on ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to access good housing at a reasonable cost. Officials from my department's housing division had the opportunity recently to brief the Social Development Committee on progress to date, and a further update has been requested after the Building Successful Community Seminar, which will be held in September. Staffing levels within the programme took a number of months to bring to full complement. As a result, while some forums are already established and the forums themselves have met, others are still in the process of finalising their membership. The forums that are established are in Lenadur and Glencollen, Dury Road and Lower Falls and they have all held initial meetings which have been positive, constructive and hugely helpful in setting out, even at an early stage, the priorities for each pilot area. The three uh, other regeneration forums uh, are now almost complete and will be meeting very soon. And the key thing is that across all six forums, we have a wide range of skilled, dedicated and innovative people. A good complement of people with a range of skills from a range of backgrounds. And I look forward to uh, the seminar in September that will give us an opportunity to learn about best practice in housing-led regeneration and explore potential solutions to meet the particular needs of pilot areas. I call Michaela Boyle. Can I thank you, the Minister, for his, your response? Uh, can I ask the Minister, can you clarify if all the MLAs in each of the pilot uh, project areas were invited to sit on the forums and indeed would objective need play a central role in the programmes? Gormagat. Well, the uh, details of who is sitting on the, the forums I'm not absolutely uh, clear on. Some people did respond that they were interested in being on them, some didn't. Uh, I don't have the details of each particular one. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what does he see as the legacy for the Building Successful Communities programme in the future? Um, I thank the member for his question because this is getting to the heart of the matter. I think it is about ensuring that we have communities that are successful and sustainable and strong communities. It is about bringing together the two elements within the remit of the department about regeneration and housing. We shouldn't take things forward in silos. We should be trying to get a broad-based approach. And there are communities in a number of particularly inner city areas where there has been a high level of um, dereliction. And I don't think that people should be condemned to living in those areas of dereliction for the rest of their lives. That's simply unacceptable. Uh, we want strong communities, vibrant communities, successful communities. And my legacy, I would hope, would be that at the end of this, we will see those communities vibrant again, regenerated, places where people want to live, enjoy living, uh, working and socialising. I call Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And just to follow through from Ms Boyle's question, could the Minister outline to the House his own assessment of the quality impact assessment of these particular programmes or pilot projects? Well, these are um, pilots. They are moving into an area that... Um, I think has been somewhat neglected in the past in that the Department for Social Development has that remit for housing and regeneration. I think those two need to be uh, brought together. And I could say that work is ongoing uh, at the moment in regard uh, to the issue of equality. Um, it's important that uh, we bear in mind that equality extends to those communities that have in the past um, been neglected communities which in the past have been condemned to dereliction, they deserve an equal chance with everybody else. And I hope that it will address that issue and ensure that they are given e equality. Um, an equality screening exercise and, if necessary, equality impact assessment will be undertaken for the Building Successful Communities Programme and work on the equality screening commenced by announced the programme and is ongoing currently. In the meantime, my department um, will continue um, with that work. I call Robin Swan. For his answer, and he said one of the legacies of this programme will be a strong, vibrant community. 
Minister, the Dury Road is one of the pilot projects in my constituency in North Antrim. It already has a strong, vibrant community. But the Northern Ireland Housing Executive's proposal was actually to go in and demolish the houses in that community, and that was stopped by DSD at one stage. Can the Minister give an update that that's still a stage, or that's still the, the current situation there, that DSD will prevent the NIHE demolishing those houses until there is a way forward? Yes, the um, members raised this previously, and I have spoken about it, and I have written to um, the Housing Executive uh, about this. Um, and I think it's important that um, anything that's done in that area is done within that context of building a successful community where there is strong community buy-in. Moving on, I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number two. Um, the member will be aware that I've been seeking to have the executive discuss the welfare reform bill since the beginning of 2014. I wanted these discussions not only to reach agreement as to when the bill would come back to the assembly, but also to consider the package of measures which I have developed to help shape how welfare reform is implemented in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, it has not been possible to secure agreement on these matters with a number of the parties in the executive, and Northern Ireland is now having to deal with the financial and service consequences for their failure to agree on how we can move forward. The continued delay in securing agreement on progressing welfare reform is now increasingly putting at risk the delivery of critical social security benefits and tax credit payments for over 400,000 people and families in Northern Ireland. This is because the failure to pass the legislation will mean the legislative frameworks for social security in Northern Ireland and Great Britain will increasingly diverge. Coupled with the IT systems which currently enable the social security agency to process and pay the existing are replaced by the Department of Work and Pensions with new systems to support the new benefits. There are also financial consequences for the Northern Ireland Block Grant, and Mr. Hamilton has already indicated that unless there is agreement on welfare reform, he will have to preside over a cuts exercise in the 2014-15 June monitoring round to fund financial penalties of £13 million for 2013-14 and £87 million for 2014-15. There is also the risk of a further financial penalty of £114 million for 2015-16, and the situation will be exacerbated the longer the delay. The application of these financial penalties will have a negative impact on spending on other public services such as health and education and measures to improve and grow the Northern Ireland economy. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, very extensive answer uh, to, to the question. I wonder if the Minister could, could comment, uh, in the event that there is a failure around the executive table to get an agreement, what might be the actual implications within his own department uh, in a job situation? Thank the member for that important supplementary because this is something that I've raised on a number of occasions and it's important to spell out those implications um, very clearly. Um, around 664 staff are currently employed in the Belfast Benefit Centre, which also includes the Lissa Halley Processing Unit up in the Northwest, which provides processing for a number of working age benefits in the southeast of England, London and the home counties. And that's done work, that work is done on behalf of the Department for Work and Pensions. There are also 800 staff employed in the Child Maintenance Service, providing services to the eastern region of England on behalf of the Department for Work and Pensions. So the total number of staff providing services to regions in Great Britain is over 1,400, 1,464. Following a meeting with Ian Duncan Smith, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, in March 2012, I highlighted to this assembly on a number of occasions my concerns that these jobs will be at risk if Northern Ireland does not progress with welfare reform. This is because many of the competitive advantages which Northern Ireland offers the Department for Work and Pensions will disappear as the staff will no longer be operating the same social security systems. In recent months, we've seen the announcement and the closure of the DVA offices in Northern Ireland and the centralization of those functions back to Swansea. The 1,400 jobs in my department providing services to DWP have to compete for services in order to keep the jobs in Northern Ireland. Breaking parity and therefore not operating the same processes and systems makes those services uncompetitive and more expensive. 
And our job in this House surely is to help protect jobs rather than to put barriers in place which, could well, which would indeed result in the loss of jobs. And the total number of jobs, 1,400, including 664 at this Ahali outside Londonderry. I call Phil Flanagan. Gurum, I get the, I'll ask him clearly and uh, I, I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask him to update the House as to whether or not the issue of welfare reform and the removal of up to £750 million from our local economy was raised at a recent garden party in Downing Street, which was attended by his party leadership, uh, senior members of the British Government and some of their children? Um, I wasn't there. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, in an earlier answer, you referred to uh, what you would hope to be uh, your legacy. I wonder, would you give any thought to your legacy being uh, a champion for those who are hardest hit by welfare reform? And would you not agree that the higher, highest levels of poverty are experienced by people here in the north of Ireland? And therefore, Minister, could you outline to the House how you have championed their cause and what representation you have made to the Department of Works and Pensions? Well, I would say the members' understanding of the thing is very simplistic and superficial, to say the least. Um, I'm surprised that anyone who is a member of the Social Development Committee uh, is not aware, I'm surprised she's not aware, of uh, the extensive work that we have done in that regard. And uh, the arrangements that we have negotiated with uh, Westminster, with the Department for Work and Pensions, um, in terms of flexibilities for Northern Ireland, and the package of um, differentials um, in terms of doing things somewhat differently in Northern Ireland. Um, that's well known. It's already been stated on a number of occasions. Those are things which I've developed, which I've negotiated. Uh, it took uh, a lot of effort and endeavour and quite a number of meetings with Ian Duncan Smith, with David Freud and others to uh, secure those. It also required a lot of work by my officials on an ongoing basis with officials in DWP. And it's disappointing that the member isn't aware of the wide range of those and the way in which, when they have been mentioned in public, they have been welcomed by the vast majority of people. I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister, while I share some of your frustrations in, with regards to the introduction of welfare reform into Northern Ireland, can you tell the House when you last meaningfully engaged in, with any of the political parties in this chamber uh, to progress that matter, or have you actually been doing nothing? Well, it's a matter that is brought up very regularly around the executive table, brought up many occasions around the executive table because I think that is uh, where the matter sits at the moment. Uh, the member would also be aware, I hope, from his party colleague that uh, there is a ministerial subcommittee which has uh, been working on this for quite some time. But I think we got up to the point quite some time ago where everything possible that could be done in terms of extracting um, agreements from Westminster and trying to get a reasonable package uh, of flexibilities and differentials here for no in within Northern Ireland. Um, that's work that was done quite some time ago and really we are sitting there and have been sitting there for quite some time uh, and I think it basically is as far as it goes. Um, I met with the Secretary of State the other day and was <laughs> told again very plainly that there is nothing more to come from uh, Westminster. I think some people hold out uh, some vague hope that if they uh, keep on uh, stalling and uh, standing around and doing nothing that eventually somewhere or other uh, DWP and the Treasury will become super generous and start throwing and lavishing more things on us. That is not the case. That is not the case. And I think therefore um, the work has been done. It has been done well. It has been done thoroughly. A great deal of time and energy and effort has been put into it. Uh, and I would encourage the member to speak to his party colleague who is on the subcommittee. Moving on, I call David Hildage. Thank you, Mr. Hildage, for your question three. The, minute, um, the housing executive has advised me that the following schemes are due to start in the East Antrim constituency. Um, Lauren phase two for 283 dwellings due to start this month. Green Island, 343 dwellings due to start in uh, August 2014. Carrick-Fergus phase 3, 177 dwellings, due to start in September. And then Monkstown, New Mosley, 272 dwellings, due to start in uh, November. So um, there is uh, quite a, a number of uh, schemes there in the East Antrim constituency. And I can understand the, the members' interest in that because of all the constituencies 
Uh, that is the one where there was the most need. Um, I think over the two-year period, 12, 13, 14, 15, um, in the region of uh, 1,500 um, houses or, or, and um, homes have had or will have double glazing installed. I call David Hildridge. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for his detailed answer. Uh, could he tell us then what is the current position in relation to the programme for government target to have all housing executive homes double glazed by March 2015? The Housing Executive's estimate of the number of dwellings still to have full double glazing installed has been constantly updated as more detailed information has become available from surveys. They advise that the revised required total programme figure is 16,665. In 12 13, they started 8,856. In 2014 15, they intend to start. Uh, the 7,809 that are currently uh, outstanding, and that will bring us to the position where they will have achieved their target by March 2015. And the other good news is that because of the way that the contracts have been handle, handled, uh, the overall value of the contracts is £23 million, and this combined cost following the secondary compositions represent, represents an average saving of around 21.5% when compared to the average costs in the previous contract. And I think the, the member and other members will ensure, uh, welcome the fact of a 21.5% saving in terms of cost. I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, can, while I clearly welcome the uh, particular programme that you've outlined and the number of properties uh, that are to be uh, provided with double glazing, can you tell the House which particular methodology will be adopted, that of non-redecoration grant or redecoration grant? Um, that is not a methodology. Uh, the methodology is how the windows are fitted, not whether or not a grant is paid. And the position is that um, because of the way in uh, which the windows are now fitted, which is the normal way that they're fitted in almost all houses, uh, private sector work that they would be doing, in most cases there is now no need for a redecoration grant. I know when I had windows many years ago fitted in, in uh, my own home, uh, that the work was done in a way that did not require uh, major redecoration, whereas Previously, as I saw in many occasions when I visited schemes, uh, the work was being done in a way that left the houses extremely um, um, defective <laughs> and in need, need of uh, repair and, and, or need of redecoration. Uh, the fact is now uh, there is a significant saving, and that is good. That is sensible use of public money. I call Michael Copeland to ask the question focused on East Antrim. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Um, Deputy Speaker, uh, can the Minister confirm that both he and his department continue to avail of the services of contractors who featured in his overcharging statement of last year, and will he now accept that the figures he gave on that occasion were wrong and perhaps consider an apology? Uh, um, this is not to do with East Antrim, but it's over to the Minister if he wishes to reply. Neither has it anything particularly to do with double glazing. The three contractors uh, are P.K. Murphy, Dixon, Contractors and Ban. Those are the three who were awarded the contracts by the Housing Executive. Uh, the member is a member of the Social Development Committee and is well aware of the situation um, regarding the matter that he raised. And uh, it's a matter that's been dealt with by the Housing Executive. Uh, they have reached uh, a measure of agreement with the contractors and that is now being assessed by um, economists uh, within uh, DSD and subsequently DFP, as required by public uh, expenditure guidelines. I call John Dallat and asked him to make sure his question is related to the original question. Mr Deputy Speaker, can I say, to comply with your request, I'm absolutely over the moon that the people of East Antrim will have windows <laughs> and warm houses. And with your permission, can I dare ask the Minister when the rest of Northern Ireland might have new windows? Well, I don't know if the member missed the answer I gave earlier. The entire programme will be complete by March of next year. As promised in the programme for government, commitment was made there to have it done by March of 2015. It will be completed within that time. Moving on, I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question four. In March 2014, there were 233 applications on the waiting list for Glengormley, of which 156 were deemed to be in housing stress. And in the 12 months to March 2014, there were 37 social housing allocations. 
There have been no new social housing schemes built in the Glen Gormley area since 1999, 15 years ago. There is a combined projected social housing need, however, of 116 units identified for Glen Gormley for the period 2013-18. This can be broken down as Glen Varna, 74 units, Queen's Park, 30 units, Hightown, 12 units. In the current social housing development program, Clan Mill Housing have 21 units on site at 369 to 371 Antrim Road, and there are further 12 units uh, programmed to start between 1415 and 1617. Six units at Ballyduff Road, Carnmoney, and six units at uh, Moss Road, and these will be delivered by Apex Housing Association. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? And uh, also, I'm encouraged that, that, that there are new houses to, uh, that are, are in the pipeline to come ahead. But I'm sure the Minister shares my alarm that the fact that not one single home has been built in Glengormley for the past 15 years, even though we have had substantial need in both Queen's Park and Glenvarna. And can I ask the Minister, does he agree that it is just unacceptable? And will he undertake to find out how this has happened and why nothing has been done in the past 15 years? And also, could he also ensure that the Housing Executive proactively address this situation as a matter of great urgency? Um, I do share the, the, the member's concern that in the space of 15 years, not one single house was completed in the Glen Gormley area, which includes both Glen Varna and Queen's Park. And in spite of the fact that there is a, a significant need there for, uh, in those two estates alone, 104 units, and it's difficult to understand why there was nothing done more proactively to address that problem. There may be issues around the availability of land, but if there is a situation there and you think about it and try to address it, something surely could have been done over that 15-year period. Um, I certainly would uh, share the member's concern. I think it's important that we get to an understanding of um, why this has happened. Indeed, the member will be well aware that um, the Member of Parliament for North Belfast has raised this matter um, recently on a number of occasions, and rightly so. Um, this is the sort of information that... that uh, needs to be brought there uh, and addressed. Um, there is a need, a clear housing need, and yet it, over that 15-year period, nothing built uh, at all. The 22 units that are on site are for over 55s, so there's actually no family homes at all, even now, uh, on site uh, in the constituency. And uh, we need to understand that and make sure that the housing executive does address this need proactively. I call Alban McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Deputy Speaker. Do, just in relation to the uh, waiting list, could the Minister outline how many relets are on that uh, waiting list? Um, the area there that we're, we're dealing with, um, the figure that I quoted of a need for 104 units in Glen Varna and Queen's Park actually is a figure after you've taken account of relets. Now, I don't have the detailed figures um, for that um, particular uh, question about the number of relets. I don't have that to hand. I'm happy to, to um, get that information um, for the member. But even when you take account of relets, there was a shortage, or there is a shortage there, uh, across those two uh, states at Glengormley of 104 units. Um, so that's significant. Uh, in anybody's book, that is a significant figure, and there needs to be something done about it. And, of course, I would suggest that, actually, if there have been some new houses built, what you tend to find is when there's new build, you en end up seeing, actually, um, an increase in the demand because a new build home is always particularly attractive, and people will tend quite often to put their name down for that particular area. Uh, but there hasn't been one there in 15 years. Moving on, I call Sydney Anderson. Uh, question five, Deputy Speaker. I've been very keen to find a solution to these notoriously difficult to heat properties since I first became aware of them. Um, that's why I asked the housing executive in conjunction with the building research executive to come up with the most effective and economical solution to retrofit a thermal outer skin, 
which will greatly improve the thermal efficiency of these properties and so help the tenants to live a more comfortable life. The housing sector has undertaken already some work to upgrade external walls of single-skinned aluminium bungalows and rural cottages. This will improve the U value of the external wall element to comply with current building controlled standards. This is the measure of heat transmittance through a wall, door or window. There's been good progress on the Technology Strategy Board project in Spring Farm. The tender to complete uh, the external installation and associated works to the first three dwellings should be agreed in early July with an on-site commencement date in August 14. At the moment, my officials are liaising with the Housing Executive's technical and legal departments to look at options for all no fines or solid wall properties across uh, Northern Ireland. I call Sydney Anderson. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that response. And I welcome that finally maybe we are seeing some movement on this particular issue, as there are a number of the, these uh, properties within my own constituency. But can I ask the Minister what consideration his department and the Housing Executive uh, are giving to the issues of no fines uh, within the private housing sector? In this supplementary question, the member commented on the relevance of this for um, his own constituency, and he's right to do that. And the 5,250 housing executive properties that fall into this uh, category, um, of those 5,000, 2,000 are in Belfast, and 1,800 of them, just over that, are in North and West Belfast. But if you look beyond that in terms of constituencies, the next constituency in terms of number would be Upper Ban, where there are 566 properties that are no fines. So it is a, a significant problem. There are some constituencies where there are none at all, two constituencies, but they're spread across the constituencies in small numbers generally, with those three constituencies um, being the, the, uh, numbers, the constituencies with the highest numbers. Um, in regard to privately owned properties, one of the challenges in remedying the defects in housing executive no fines properties is how to deal with privately owned property. Uh, in many cases, no fines houses are built in terraces containing a mixture of housing executive and privately owned property. It's not possible to remedy the defects to housing executive properties without also doing so to the privately owned. And concurrently, my officials are liaising with the Housing Executive's technical and legal departments to look at options for some of the 8,000 privately owned no fines properties. We're very conscious of the issue, and it's one that we're looking at. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'll just ask the Minister if there are any difficulties uh, in identifying the number of firms who can carry out this kind of work, and can he confirm that there's no risk of any potential conflict of interest either between himself or his party? Um, there are actually quite a number of um, companies across the United Kingdom doing this work already. Um, it's not new. It's work that has been undertaken in other regions of the United Kingdom, in various parts of Great Britain, over many, many years. And I had the opportunity of seeing um, work being undertaken in, in Liverpool uh, on some of the estates where this work has been done. So um, the, it is fairly standard sort of thing. What's been done in Spring Farm is to look at um, the best possible way of doing it. There are um, questions around the particular thickness of insulation, um, how that should be applied, what form it should take, and they're doing there a comparison across different technologies. Also the opportunity of seeing that some of this work done in Germany on, on uh, one occasion. So there, there are plenty of folk who would be able to do this work, and uh, I'm sure the member will agree with me it's work that needs done. I call from a can. Question six. No. I call from a can. Well, uh, can the minister tell us, uh, uh, can he ensure us that any recommendations coming from any investigation by the Equality Co Commission will be uh, implemented in full <coughs> across his department? The role of the Commission and its power to investigate and make recommendations are set out in legislation. The Commission has not made a determination of whether or not the Department has failed to comply with its equality scheme. That will be decided by the Commission following its investigation, and it would not be appropriate to comment further at this stage. And that is the end of our period of listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Declan McAleer. Uh, Garvin, I've got uh, last count, Cordia. 
Uh, the, minister, the Minister has stated that he will deliver 2,000 homes over the next year. Can you indicate to us how many of those will be social and affordable? The um, fact is that we have stated very clearly our intention is to have 2,000 social homes in the next 12 months and 2,000 in the following year, social homes. Um, in fact, I met with the Housing Association, well, the Northern Ireland Federation of Housing Associations, and with the Housing Executive's Acting Chief Executive um, just the other day um, to talk about a range of issues about how we can increase the supply. Because the challenge here is really to make sure that the Housing Associations in Northern Ireland are in a position to meet that target. And that's why we're doing work with them and looking at the obstacles um, to, to building more. But uh, I think we're well uh, online for the 2000 uh, this year. And uh, it was important to have that discussion with them and with the housing executive to um, bring out any issues that they had that might be an obstacle or a blockage. And I welcome the, the positive, constructive attitude at the meeting and the, the approach from both the executive and the federation. I call Declan McLear. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, the Minister indicated that he'll deliver uh, 2,000 housing units over the next year. Could you say if these will be housing starts or housing completions? Um, the way in which the uh, figures are, are calculated here as to starts and completions um, can be quite complicated. If, they, if they're started, and the, the, the aim would be to have 2,000 homes started in these 12 months, which would be a higher figure than for many years, it would be one of the highest figures for many years, and would be a significant achievement. Um, that's why we, we put so much effort last year into making sure that as much land, because the availability of land is one of the issues, and uh, that was why so much effort was put last year into getting the land teed up so that things could start on site this year. Moving on, I call Sean Lynch. The last can, call you. can the Minister define what he means by social need for the the purpose of the proposed regeneration housing bill. I think that if you look at a number of the, the areas that we're talking about, it's pretty clear what social need is. We're dealing there with areas that, first of all, are uh, neighborhood renewal areas, areas of real deprivation, areas of real disadvantage. We're dealing with areas where it's clear that what has been done in the past has not delivered as it should. And we're dealing with areas which are, are quite often blighted by dereliction. Um, and when I look at those communities and see derelict properties and, and um, buildings that are half demolished and so on, and derelict land with um, rubble strewn across it, I have to pay credit to the people who have stuck it out and lived on in those communities. They deserve credit for being there, but we shouldn't allow them to have to remain in that situation. So there's a real social need there. It can also be a range of things. That's why we're running uh, a range of pilots to look at different areas with particular needs that are, are different. Um, they'll not be exactly the same, and indeed the remedies they come up with, the, 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 the particular resolution that they come up with will not necessarily be the same in each case. I call Sean Lynch for supplementary. Gom Gwaker Slashinara Asin Fragdushin. I want to thank the Minister for his comprehensive uh, answer. Uh, can the Minister outline what is meant by housing element in the relation to the development scheme in the proposed housing bill? Um, the issue I'm not entirely clear as to what the member is is I have to be honest what the member is getting at in, in, in the question. Uh, but I'm happy to engage with him further uh, to, to um, see exactly what information he's seeking and happy to supply that. Um, but at this point in time, I, I'm not exactly clear. Maybe it's not possible in the format here, but I'm not entirely clear what the member means, to be honest. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister whether he agrees with senior housing executive officials that the treatment of Michael Abiona by a small number of individuals was racial intimidation, or the First Minister, who was unable to conclude whether he was treated any differently than someone from up the country? The, um, disappointing sometimes to find that people try to take situations, turn them um, to make political points. And I think that uh, the member should learn that lesson. Um, the situation has been clearly identified by the housing executive and by others. 
Um, and the nature of their decision, they, they made it absolutely clear how they say it. I'm not familiar with the details, other than what I've seen in the newspapers. I'm not familiar with the details of the situation, other than to say what I read in the newspapers. But um, having said that, um, anyone, anyone should have the right to be treated equally by the housing executive and should not be disadvantaged or discriminated in any way uh, because of their race or anything else. Um, I think that the position, therefore, as I see it, is very clear. No one should be disadvantaged. No one should be discriminated against in any way at all. People have the right under the law in our country to be treated absolutely equally and fairly. And I hope the member will be reassured by that statement. I call Chris Little. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Yeah, uh, I welcome the, the clear response that uh, the Minister for Social Development was able to give. Um, and I, I find it somewhat surprising that he uh, hasn't been across the detail of such a serious issue. Uh, my understanding is that we've had 10 instances in the last three months where people have been able to accept offers of housing tenancy due to racial intimidation. So can I ask the Minister what exactly he is doing to address this serious situation uh, and to ensure that uh, perpetrators are penalised rather than victims in relation to accessing housing that, to which they are entitled? Well, the first thing here is, of course, that these are matters primarily for the housing executive and for the police. Those are the two agencies that have primary role here. And I'll take Order. no comments at all from Sinn Féin members in here about anything to do with racism after 30 years of a terrorist campaign that thrived on a racist attack on anybody who was British and not Irish. Alex Atwood is not in his place. I call Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, is the Minister content with the criteria presently in place for housing associations for a new build programme with so few bungalows and limited bungalows being built? I remember for what is an important question, a good question, uh, because it's an issue that's often raised. The um, decision was taken some years ago in regard to bungalows that other than in um, exceptional cases where there's a particular need because of a disability, um, it, it, we're not in a position anymore where you have the mass building of, of bungalows as we did have at one time. And I think one of the issues there was, there were two issues. There was one about the general cost of building, but also particularly around the cost of land, uh, because obviously you're acquiring a greater uh, footprint with, with bungalows. Um, but in fact, in some areas, if you look at the amount of land that is sitting there unused in public ownership, it would be quite easy uh, to provide bungalows. So I've actually spoken to the executive and to my officials and asked them to look at this. I call Pat Ramsey. Yeah, I'm reassured by the Minister, but I wonder would he take it a step further, because in recent new developments in my own constituency, first of all, the social mix isn't working, because we have an environment where you have 80 or 90 houses, and within a matter of months, you have 12, 15 families seeking transfers out of that estate. And also, there is discrimination against older people who are living in three- and four-bedroom houses who will not get accommodations. Could I ask the Minister, would he now undertake an urgent review of those circumstances to encourage housing associations to build more bungalows? Um, as I said there a moment ago, um, the point has been already raised with officials and with the housing. I have asked them to look at this again, um, because I'm not sure that we're in exactly the same position that we were some years ago in terms of land values and so on. Members are absolutely right also that um, there are older folk who would prefer um, to downsize to a smaller property and free up a family home. Um, and in fact, that was one of the first things I did when I came into the department, was to look at the, the mix of housing within the social housing development program. Um, because in their previous ministers, it seemed to be just keep building and building more and more family homes. Whereas if you build to accommodate older folk, quite often just a single person or maybe uh, an elderly couple, quite often you're freeing up a, a, a larger home in that way. And there's some particularly good schemes. I, I, I know that many folk prefer a bungalow, but there are some really good schemes to encourage the member to look at them if he hasn't seen them as yet, uh, where there are small groups of maybe a dozen, 20 apartments uh, together for elderly folk. And they, they do, different people have different preferences. 
But I visited a scheme some time ago in uh, the Main Street, uh, I think it's Mark Court, uh, close to St. Mark's Church there in the Main Street in uh, Newton Arts. And it was an excellent scheme where one of the pensioners said to me as I was waiting, uh, she said, we're like a wee family here. It had that sense of family and community about them. There's another scheme in Bangor, um, where again, there was a strong sense of community amongst the old folk. So in some cases, it does actually work extremely well. But we need to look at having more diversity rather than just build more of the same. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister tell us how many people are claiming universal credit in Great Britain? I would have to concede that there are many statistics that I do carry in my head, but that is not one of the ones that I normally carry. I think topical questions are uh, tended to be more about a topic rather than a very specific figure than that, but I'm more than happy to uh, supply the member with the exact figure on all of these things if she wishes to have them. I'm happy to supply that. I call Joanne Dobson. Mr. Deputy Speaker, well, can I enlighten the Minister? Yesterday, as of yesterday, it was 5,610. Given the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions said in 2011 that a million people would be claiming universal credit by April 2014, does the Minister not accept that had we went with his and his party's proposals in October 2012, then we too would be experiencing the exact same problems here? Well, it's always good, I suppose, if you're asking a question, you know the answer in advance. Uh, so I'm indebted to the member for telling me that it's 5,610. Um, the fact is that uh, that is the situation in Great Britain. Um, I'm glad to say I'm not responsible for the situation in Great Britain. I have enough difficulties dealing with the situation here in Northern Ireland. But in GB, clearly, there has been uh, a slowness in delivering. I would point out, however, that it was always intended that the um, situation in Northern Ireland would be that we would be at the very tail end of any implementation. So whatever lessons are learned, whatever difficulties there are on the way, by coming in at the very end, we would not be the ones on whom the lessons are learned. Rather, we would be in a position where the lessons have already been learned. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I'm sure the Minister would like to join with me today in terms of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth visiting uh, Crumlin Road Jail and other parts of the province. But could the Minister update the House in terms of what progress has been made in terms of the despicable and disgraceful state of the courthouse, which is actually opposite the Crumlin Road Jail? Come on, yeah. um, yes, um, welcome the, the question, and it was a pleasure indeed uh, to be this morning at uh, Crumlin Road um, uh, Jail to um, meet Her Majesty and Prince Philip uh, on their visit to uh, my constituency of North Belfast. Yeah. Um, as regards the, the Crumlin Road Courthouse, the fact is that the Department has engaged Turley Consultants to take forward a feasibility study to identify potential usage for the courthouse. Um, a draft economic appraisal has been completed and is currently being considered by the department's economists. And the next steps would then be approval of the economic appraisal, and that will set out the preferred option uh, and should indicate the way forward. It is a tragedy that we have such a fantastic attraction there, uh, drawing so many visitors um, day by day, week by week, into that part of North Belfast uh, in, in the sense of the numbers visiting the jail. But the whole package has to be not only the jail, but the courthouse and, of course, the tunnel linking them. And um, sadly, the courthouse is in an appalling condition. It is in private ownership and has been over a number of years and has fallen into uh, decay and neglect. So there is something there that needs to be done about that, indeed. I call Trevor Clark. I thank the Minister for the answer. Um, and I, I share his enthusiasm in terms of how this, this could go. Uh, look overall in terms of the, the two coming together, but how hopeful is the Minister that we can come to a resolution um, for the courthouse so as we actually can complement the two buildings? The, the level of um, dereliction is now such that it is a, a real challenge. Um, the, the roof has been damaged on a number of occasions, the building has been vandalised, um, and significant internal damage as well as the damage to the roof. Um, and it is probably the case that whatever is done will have to be done on an incremental basis. But I think that there is potential there. We need to get the report and then see what can be done. But as I say, it also needs to be borne in mind it is in private ownership. And that is the end of questions to the Minister for Social Development.